Fish on Fridays. I'm Al McCauley and today I have an arduous task with this episode. I am going to try to explain the life, the legacy, the impact of one of the most beloved saints in all of church history. And on a personal note, she's my favorite saint that I've ever studied or learned about. I'm talking about Saint Therese of Lisieux. Sometimes she's known as the Little Flower. Now, if you've watched past episodes of Fish on Fridays, and if you haven't, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or always check us out. We've got all of our, our past episodes archived um, on our Facebook page as well. But if you've watched past episodes, you know I've talked about, for instance, sacramentals. And I've made mention of things like icons you see behind me. That's St. Therese down there. I've talked about religious medals in that episode on sacramentals, and I've mentioned how I wear this medal of St. Teresa of Lisieux, her likeness is on it, every day of my life. And you might say, well, why are you, why are you so drawn to this particular saint? And, and there's no one easy answer to that, but I want to talk a little bit in this episode about her life and then her impact and what drew me to her. Very briefly, she was born in 1873. Therese was born in 1873 to two parents, uh, Louis and Zélie Martin, and who, by the way, are saints in their own rights now. They've been canonized by the Catholic Church relatively recently. Her parents had nine children. Four died early on. Five made it to adulthood. All five were girls, and all five became nuns. Imagine that. Therese, St. Therese, was a uh, discalced Carmelite nun. She entered the Carmelite convent at the, the a very unusual age of 15. Typically, you wouldn't enter till you were 18, but she had this calling her, her life from early on that she wanted to be a nun, and so uh, specifically a Carmelite nun. Now, let me take a, a second to explain that. The Carmelite uh, order has a charism of austerity. They're, they're kind of a strict uh, order. They live in silence a lot of times. They have very strict uh, rules about what they can do, what, how much they can own, how many things they can have, uh, how many visitors they can have. It's very, very strict by our standards. And, and their charism, their main spiritual gift is to really pray. Pray for people like you and I outside of the convent who, who don't either have the time or don't take the time to pray for ourselves, ultimately for the conversion of our souls. That's, that's their goal. So Therese, at a very young age, had this sense of wanting to become a nun. Her mom died from breast cancer when she was four. Her oldest sister, Pauline, who was like her new mother, um, left to go into the convent herself, and, and Therese was overcome with this sense of uh, abandonment. Everybody's leaving me. And so um, it wasn't until she was about 13 that she had this conversion experience of sorts where she realized that she was to live for others through God, not for herself. And so she applied uh, at a very young age to enter the convent. She was said, told no by the priest, by the uh, bishop. And so uh, she and her dad and her sister, Celine, who was not yet in the convent, went on a pilgrimage to Rome. They actually met with Pope Leo XIII, and she broke all protocols and said, I want to become a nun. And, and he basically said, if it's God's will, you'll enter. Um, well, it was God's will because she received notice that after the Easter season of her 15th uh, year of life, she could enter in the convent, and so she did. She became a Carmelite at 15 years of age. What's interesting about Therese is she's going to live there for nine years in relative obscurity, known to very few people on the outside of the convent. She's going to die at the age of 24 of TB, of tuberculosis, which wasn't uncommon at that time. But she's going to live for nine years as this nun, die at the early age of 24 in relative obscurity. And there should be no reason that I'm making this video about her. There should be no reason that most people who are watching this video probably know who she was or at least have heard of her. But the fact is, we do know all that. And I would suggest to you that that's God's grace working through a very simple soul. Now, Teresa's impact can't be felt in a lot of ways that you would uh, associate with typical saints. She wasn't a martyr. She had no major mystical experiences at all, no, no visions or anything of that nature. She wasn't really well-schooled in theology. She had no advanced degrees or anything of that nature. And she wrote relatively little. And yet today, the Catholic Church not only recognizes her as a saint, but they celebrate her as a doctor of the church. She's only one of 35 men and women of all the thousands of saints in our history. She's only one of 35 men and women, five of which are women, to be recognized as a doctor of the church, meaning she is a preeminent teacher of the faith. And you might say, well, how is this simple little girl who died at the age of 24, how is she able to reach that level of saintliness, to be a doctor of the church? Well, quite frankly, it's the, the universal and accessible impact of her teaching, oftentimes called the little way. 
I would suggest to you that the little way is probably the easiest thing you'll ever understand in terms of Christian theology, but the absolute hardest to implement in your daily life. It is for me. Now, I'm going to stop right there and just make this a bit personal. It's hard for me to explain my attraction to Therese other than to say it this way. <clears throat> Even though she lived a good century and a half before me, I feel that when I study her, when I read her, when I pray with her, for some reason, I feel like I knew her, that she was alive to me, that, that she is a real person in a way that no other saint ever has been. So I can learn about the past of saints, and I can read their writings, and I can hear about their great deeds, and I can be really inspired by them. But there's something about Therese that made me feel like she's an actual person in my life. I know that sounds very strange, but the closest thing I can, the closest analogy I can come to uh, to explain this is both of my parents have passed away. And when I think about them and when I pray with them, I can, I know them. They were physically in my life. And I, and, and so I can, I can speak to them. I can have a relationship with them that continues. I feel that way about Therese, even though I never met her. And so it's very strange, but I think this is my opinion. I think it's God's grace that uses Therese, not just in her life, but continues to use Therese as a conduit, as a, as a way, as a magnet to attract people to himself. Now, there's a saying I've used over and over again throughout the years that we don't need saints to reach God. God uses saints to reach us. And I think if there's ever been an example of that, in our history as Catholic Christians, it's been Therese. God uses Therese to reach us. And, and that's really what it's about. That's what the goal of all saints are, is to be with God, but to have the rest of us be attracted to him in the same way that they were. So a few years before she passed away, when she was first diagnosed with tuberculosis, the mother superior at her convent said, well, you're not just going to be sitting around in your butt doing nothing. While you're convalescing, while you're hopefully getting better, unfortunately she didn't, but while you're recuperating and while you're resting, you're going to write. I'd like you to write your memories, your earliest memories, and just try to put them in a book that will ultimately be used maybe for other uh, incoming nuns, novices, other people to read as a model of sorts. We have this book today. This book has come down to us. It's called The Story of a Soul. And if you've not read it, I suggest it highly. By our standards, it's kind of syrupy sweet, but it's really straightforward, and it's really kind of an amazing insight into this woman's life. Not just as a nun, but her spiritual life as well. And it's from these pages that we glean her spiritual philosophy, which again is called The Little Way. Now, I'm going to speak about that in a minute, but The Story of a Soul is incredibly popular. In the 20th century, it was the most published Christian book after the Bible. It's been translated in over 50 languages, and it's accessible to a lot of people, partly because it's not deep theology, and it's not written with a lot of philosophy and things of that nature. It's pretty straightforward, um, and it's, again, it gives a good glimpse into her life. All right, so the little way, I want to talk about the impact of this spiritual philosophy called the little way. And there's three major takeaways that I would offer to you that she's trying to impart on us in her writings. And the first one is humility. Now, this is why I say the little way is easy to understand but hard to implement. Imagine being on the interstate. How many times have you driven on the interstate and you've wanted to flip somebody off or you've wanted to curse? And maybe you have and hopefully not, but maybe you've gotten so angry because someone wants to sneak in front of you and you speed up and you say, you're not getting in front of me today. The humility that we have to practice daily that says, I'm going to slow up so that you can get in front of me. How many times have we been in arguments with people where we have to get the last word? Boy, is that true in our, our political circles, right? The idea of having humility to let the other people have the last word, that's a very difficult thing to do. But that's what we're called to do as, as Christians. That's what Jesus did. When he, when he washed his disciples' feet, he practiced humility. When he died on the cross, he practiced humility. And so that's the example that, that, that she uses and that she lived by. When she was in the convent, she had to put up with annoying nuns and certain habits that they had that drove her crazy. <clears throat> and what she would do is offer that to Christ and somehow connect it to Christ. And in case you think, well, that's kind of a small deal, it's not very heroic, I would suggest it's the little things in life that make us the angriest. Who didn't put the toothpaste cap back on? Who didn't make ice when you took the last ice cube? Things of that nature. Those little things have great impact. And, and I think Therese, Therese knew that, and so she lived her life in such a way that she would practice great humility. 
The second part of the little way that I want to stress is something called abandonment. Now, I don't mean like leaving somebody behind. Abandonment is that total trust in God. Now, if you've ever been on a retreat before, you've all done those things called um, those trust falls where you hold your arms back and you fall into the arms of people who are waiting to catch you. This is kind of what we're think what Teresa is thinking about spiritually, that we have to trust in God for everything that we've seen, all the goodness in our life. We have to trust in his will and we have to abandon ourselves to that. That's not easy because we like to think we're in charge and we like to think that we're in control. And Teresa is, is really telling us that, you know what, God is, is the captain of this ship and we have to trust in that. We have to have trust in his love and his mercy and, and his strength and his guidance to help us through times in our life. And how do we do that? How do we practice humility and abandonment? Through the third step of the little way, and that is prayer. Now, this is probably the reason I was most attracted to Therese, is her theory on prayer. Basically, it's pray as you can, not as you can't, but pray. I'll say that again because I think it's important. Pray as you can, not as you can't, but pray. The point here is if you are somebody who has a hard time praying from prayer books, but you can pray in your mind, then do that. If you're somebody who can pray with the scriptures, but not necessarily a rosary, then do that. But the point is to pray that we only are able to have that sense of humility in our hearts. We're only able to practice that abandonment, that trust in, in God's love and mercy, if we pray, if we give it over to God in prayer, if we communicate with God, if we stress that relationship with God. That's really important. Those threefold parts of the little way, humility, abandonment, and prayer. Incredibly easy to understand, but really, really difficult to implement. I'd like to leave you with three endearing images that Therese puts forth in her book, uh, The Story of the Soul. And the first is this, that the world of souls is Jesus's garden. And she says, she makes mention of the fact that the world would be very boring, every garden would be boring if all, all there were were roses. That she, she referred to herself as just a little flower, as a little daisy. But we need those daisies and those smaller little flowers to accentuate the important ones. And the important thing to remember about this image is that the roses aren't necessarily better than the, than the daisies or the smaller flowers. They're just different and they're they're graced differently for different purposes. As a corollary to that, she uses the example of a, a pitcher and a thimble. And if you fill them both up, I'm hoping you all know what a thimble is. Um, let's think of a small cup instead. I'll use that image. A, a pitcher of water and a glass full of water. And if you fill them both up with water to the brim, the question I'd ask is, which is the most full? Of course, the answer is, well, they're both full. They're both equally filled because they're both to the brim. Oftentimes, humans will get caught up on, well, the pitcher's bigger, so it's better. And Therese would say that's not true. Because we're both filled with God's grace, we're all filled with God's grace, it doesn't matter if you're the CEO of the company or the person pushing the broom at the end of the day in the factory. If you're doing that with great love, you have been equally graced by God for that particular job, for that particular vocation, and you are in that vocation to serve each other, not to lord it over each other or to hold it against each other. It's not an us and them, us versus them mentality. That's a very important thing to understand. There's the world of souls is vast, it's varied, but we're all graced by God equally to share in his love and to be an expression of his love to the rest of the world. The last image I want to leave you with is that of a dandelion. And she talked about how, Therese talks about how she was a simple soul. She was like a child. And I want to ex what, explain that a bit. She is talking about being childlike as opposed to childish. Now that's important distinction. So when my children are very young on Mother's Day, they might not have realized it was Mother's Day. And when they did come to that realization, they might run into the backyard, pick a bunch of dandelions and come in and give them to mom and say, we love you, mom, happy Mother's Day. And she would think, oh, that's so cute. That's so beautiful. I'm gonna put them in a little cup and a little vase and, and they're my kids' flowers. Now, if I, as her husband, as a grown man, see that and I have forgotten Mother's Day and I run out into the backyard and pick a bunch of dandelions and give them to her, Chances are she's not going to be nearly as forgiving to me or as understanding or as happy. So that would be more childish because I was thinking of myself to the point where I didn't think of her. So I want to make sure you understand that being childlike versus childish. 
And you know, speaking of flowers, she always talked about this idea. She didn't coin the phrase, bloom where you're planted, but you've no doubt heard that. That is a very Theresian thing to say, bloom where you're planted. It doesn't mean you put up with garbage. It doesn't mean you put up with bad stuff. It means where you are in life, you bloom, you grow, you make the best of it. You're here, let's do something with that, always with the eye toward understanding God's grace and living that grace out in your own life. Ultimately, Therese was all about performing small acts, ordinary acts in your day with extraordinary love. To do that, to pray, to trust in God, and to do all of those things with great humility. Ultimately, that's what's going to change the world. If we do that in our little corners of the world, that can only have a ripple effect out into the world. And that's how we change the world. We do that with great love, great humility, great trust in God, and always praying for that end. Thanks so much for watching. I know this went a little long today, but again, Therese means a whole lot to me and I hope she does to you. If you have any stories about Therese you'd like to share, please feel free to leave some comments. Um, in the meantime, please keep tuning in for more Fish on Fridays. Be good to each other and God bless.